Hi, I'm Rayburn Johnson. And I'm Steve Sensenick. And this is Beyond the Box. Here's your invitation to explore life outside the box of institutional religion. This is a place where there are no walls to restrict our search for truth as we embrace the ambiguity of defining our life in Christ. So unbuckle your seatbelt, recline your chair, throw caution to the wind, and get ready for the ride that is Beyond the the Box. Welcome back to Beyond the Box, everyone. It is great to be back with you. I wish we could have joined you before now, but it has been a tremendously hectic month with a lot of big life changes for me personally. So I'm glad I could join you now. I'm just sorry I haven't been able to do it for the last few weeks and that Steve and I haven't been able to get together. Busy, busy times. But hopefully we can get back on track here soon. However, I have to say I'm really enjoying the conversations going on over on the Facebook page. I'm so glad you guys have just really taken ownership of that and really looked at it as a place to dialogue with each other and to discuss uh, our faith in Jesus and our life in Christ. I just think it's awesome. So you guys keep that up. I think it's a great forum for people just to get together and really ask questions, explore ideas, And you guys are doing a tremendous job of it. I feel privileged just to be able to listen in on the conversations that go on there. So thank you for doing that. Today we are joined by Dr. Richard Beck for an awesome, 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 riveting, all the adjectives you can think of it, discussion about his book, Unclean, Meditations on Purity, Hospitality, and Mortality, Unclean tremendous book. I highly recommend you go pick it up. This conversation is one of the longest we've ever had on Beyond the Box, and I tell you, every minute is power-packed. Amazing stuff with Richard Beck. Richard, thank you for taking the time to do this. Folks, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, get, Get on that roller coaster, and let's go for a ride. Well, folks, thank you so much for joining us back on the Beyond the Box today. I am very tickled to be joined once again by Dr. Richard Beck to talk about his book, Unclean, Meditations on Purity, Hospitality, and Mortality. Richard, thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the podcast again. Well, looking forward to being with you again. I tell you, this book is so fascinating. I read through it, I guess, about a year ago and um, picked it back up and started going back through it, especially after we did our Slavery of Death series. And there is just so much good stuff in here, not only um, not only about the psychology of disgust, which is what this book's primarily about, but it really ties in with your Slavery of Death series, and I, I feel like maybe uh, enhances the conversation that we had there. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, in, in Unclean, you say that the, the central argument of the book is that the psychology of disgust and contamina- contamination regulates how many Christians reason with and experience notions of holiness, atonement, and sin. Can you talk a little bit, a little bit about the psychology of disgust, what it is, and how you got interested in it? I got interested in it um, almost by accident. I, I just kind of randomly went to a, a conference presentation many years ago at a conference uh, where Paul Rosen, uh, who's kind of the world's leading researcher in disgust and contamination psychology, was presenting. And um, as we can talk about, and I talk about in the book, we can talk about the Dixie Cup experiment and his interesting research on baking brownies to look like feces and other kinds of things. <laughs> and I just walked out of that thing going, wow, first of all, you know, wow, people get paid to do this for a living, <laughs> um, do these disgust simulations. Um, but but I knew I had, I had encountered something pretty interesting about moral uh, moral psychology. And in recent uh, years, I think a lot more has been published out there um, about this. Um, people might have picked up in different publications or books that have been published. Like I think Jonathan Haidt uh, just published a book called The Righteous Mind. Uh, he's a leading researcher in this area as well. Um, but it wasn't a, but, so I knew I'd found something really interesting about moral psychology, but did not really connect it to the church very much for a couple of years until um, a friend of mine, Mark Love, he, he uh, is a director of a missional leadership uh, master's degree up there in Rochester, uh, Michigan. And he was doing a, 
a talk at our church about the Eucharist, and I remember him saying that that the central symbol of Christian worship uh, is a table, and he kind of painted this big inclusive vision of of, of Eucharist and welcoming people to table. It's kind of the central symbol of Christian worship in life, and I kind of left feeling kind of really big-hearted and wholehearted. I was like, wow, you know, and I love that vision of kind of radical hospitality. Hmm. But as I pondered it, I, was, I kept on wondering to myself, what, what, what kind of sabotages that? Uh, what causes us to, uh, the church to kind of actually do the opposite, you know, end up becoming gated communities and shunning others? And, and it was at that moment that that whole lecture on disgust psychology kind of snapped back into memory, and, and I started making a bunch of connections about that. And so that was the beginning um, of Unclean, when I kind of um, began thinking through the way purity psychology um, and the dynamics of disgust psychology might be implicated in uh, failures of hospitality in Christian mm. communities. So it was kind of a fortuitous combination of a different different things. I didn't set out to kind of make the connections, but kind of almost stumbled into them um, um, over time. Well, that's, that's the thing I've found um, about your blog so much and all the stuff that I've read by you, Richard, is that you have this way, this knack for combining um, – well, of course, I mean, with you, being, with you being an experimental psychologist, you have this way of taking psychology and, and combining it with theology in such a way that really just sheds a whole new light on things that we've never looked at before. I know for me, I've just been – I've been blown away by a lot of the things I've read on your blog and your blog is probably the only one that I read regularly. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> um, so, so setting up this whole idea of the psychology of disgust, because there's a lot of people out there going, what the heck are you guys talking about? You, you mentioned the Dixie cup experiment. Can you elaborate on that a little bit and tell people kind of the significant part of that? Yeah. Again, this is, this is a very simple, uh, uh, demo um, that uh, Rosen and other discussed researchers kind of come back to, uh, and it's just, it's pretty simple. I start the book off with it, um, uh, and it's just asking people to imagine just swallowing just swallowing the spittle that they currently have in their mouth. Uh, you know, we do that. You know, I don't know how many times we do that a day, and we don't even think about it. But even if you ask people to spit into a cup, a Dixie cup, and then the, to quickly redrink it, um, all of a sudden at that. Um, suggestion they begin balking a little bit, um, finding the prospect of that disgusting. But the question is, you know, what is the physical difference between swallowing the spittle in your mouth versus uh, spitting it into a cup and quickly redrinking it? Um, there doesn't seem to be much physical difference, but there's a big, obviously, psychological difference. And it just illustrates that disgust is primarily, uh, primarily, um, perhaps due to its kind of evolutionary roots, um, fundamentally a boundary monitoring psychology. Uh, the minute the, the spit leaves the mouth, um, it's, it's foreign, it's alien, it's other, it's a potential contaminant. And so um, we, we don't want to reincorporate it. And so that's kind of the, the basic idea of this kind of disgust and purity idea that this um, emotion and the psychological dynamics associated with it are fundamentally about monitoring uh, boundaries and mm. Uh, and, and that uh, purity and um, is achieved through a quarantine or uh, expelling something from uh, the inside to the outside, the contaminant. Uh, and so obviously that makes sense in the area of food, but uh, what happens is those same psychological dynamics become applied to human beings, mm -hmm. uh, where, where human beings are um, expelled from community where the boundaries of the community are being monitored by this same psychology. So that's the connection or kind of a primal food-based psychology, what's called core disgust, mm. begins being uh, connected to a variety of other domains, morality, uh, sociality, and then ultimately even the body. Uh, and so those are kind of the domains we kind of walk through in the book. Mm -hmm. So what is that difference between uh, core disgust and, and you talk about socio-moral disgust? Well, core disgust is the is the food, um, the, the the food psychology um, that's obviously very adaptive. Um, it's a psychology that, that protects our body from incorporating uh, toxic substances or contaminants. Um, but what happens is, uh, and what we see is that um, our basic uh, and perhaps even innate 
uh, understandings of morality um, uh, get regulated by the same psychology. We think of uh, sins and moral failures as uh, contaminations, as, as so we uh, see sin as being in a state of being unclean um, or, or or dirty, and thus we understand righteousness or, or becoming holy as a, as a form of purification or watching, washing. Mm. Uh, and so that's the, the moral part of it, um, where behaviors become uh, spiritual pollutants or spiritual mm. contaminants. The social part is obviously where human beings become vectors in contamination. So the, the easiest example of this in the scriptures that I spent a lot of time with is like in Matthew 9, where Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners, uh, and the Pharisees stand on the outside looking in, and pulls disciples over and say, your teacher eats with tax collectors uh, and sinners. And so Jesus responds with um, a quote from the prophet Hosea, saying, uh, you should go and learn what it means that I desire mercy uh, and not sacrifice. Um, the point there, the story there, is that the Pharisees see Jesus' association with these human beings, these tax collectors and sinners, as the vector of contamination. Um, and then Jesus uh, has an argument with them about what should trump in that instance, this kind of pursuit of purity, uh, the sacrificial Levitical impulse, um, or mercy, uh, the prophetic impulse to cross these social moral boundaries of purity to reach out and embrace um, the tax collectors and sinners of the society. Um, so those are the two examples of kind of connecting the, that's this psychology to moral behaviors as contaminants, sins as making us unclean, and then the social part is human beings. Um, and we can think of a variety of, you know, human beings that are considered to be vectors of contamination. And it's a primal thing. It begins in childhood. You know, kids play the game of cooties on the playground right. um, where, uh, where, the, where a kid is touched and they have the contaminant and everybody flees them. Uh, and then when they touch the next kid, they have the contaminant. And so it's a, mm -hmm. it's a primitive thing, and it's been used, that psychology has been used um, uh, as privileged groups have constantly attributed contagious properties to um, despised or inferior groups. Um, I think a lot of people probably know the movie The Help that came out a few years ago, and uh, you can think about the way uh, contaminating properties or disgusting properties was attributed by the white population to the African-American population in Jim Crow South, um, the way the Nazis uh, saw the, uh, their pursuit of pure blood purity, saw the Jews as vector of contamination. But there's other despised groups in our culture, you know, anywhere from still ethnic groups to um, sexual minorities and so on. The list is very long, sadly. Mm -hmm. Mm, very true. Uh, one thing that you said that I, I found fascinating that I'd never realized, but it made a lot of sense after I read it, was that we're not born with disgust, that small children don't have, you know, if they do have a disgust response, it's very small. And the and the idea that disgust develops in a way that's similar to language. Can you elaborate on that for us? Yeah, a lang yeah language we know has, has kind of a sensitive period. You know, kids don't need to go to school to learn the language. By the time they get, you know, to kindergarten, they're already pretty fluent in their native tongue. Um, and so there seems to be this kind of sensitive window where they just need to be ex exposed to their mother mother tongue that they just kind of soak it up very quickly. But then, um, as we all know, as we uh, try to learn our high school languages, um, it becomes very effortful after that window closes and rote memorization and memory cards and drill becomes the only way to do it. And even then, it's hard to get rid of your accent. Um, and disgust seems to be kind of similar, where in the early in the early years, kids are notorious for having absolutely zero disgust response. I remember my son, Brendan, we were walking, um, we were on a New York City subway, and he found some gum stuck to, <laughs> I don't even want to remember where it was stuck to, in a public subway, and he picked it up and put it in his mouth <laughs> and 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 we were just revolted by it but you know kids will will put about anything in their mouth but eventually what will happen is they suddenly um, will become very squeamish and, and what we think is going on there is that um, uh, there seems to be a kind of a almost promiscuity in what we will possibly taste 
Mm. And that seems to make us open to a wide variety of ecosystems. So somebody raised in one part of the world or another part of the world is going to be exposed to very different foods. Um, and, and so therefore your taste can, um, because it's so wide at the beginning, you can acquire the tastes of your culture. But then eventually, as I think most parents are aware, kids eventually got locked down pretty quickly and they become really picky. Things they used to like, they don't like anymore, and there's a real narrowing um, of, uh, and so they almost kind of lock in their, to their um, this very limited set of foodstuffs that are available in their culture, even though huge, I mean, most of the things around us, in our, the amount of edible things that we could possibly eat that we don't um, is enormous. So it seems to be kind of an adaptive thing where there mm. seems to be a window where uh, we can acquire new tastes, but then it locks down. For the purpose of the book, that means that disgust is very uh, culturally uh, malleable and shaped and, and is op- open to a wide variety of cultural inputs to kind of tune it to various things. So obviously what we're, we're talking about here is food, but... Um, because of this kind of openness to discuss, the same kind of psychology can get detached to, again, um, moral behaviors in, in, in human beings. Um, and so it's a good thing in the sense from, from a food standpoint, but uh, the downside is that discuss can get attached to these kind of non-food-related entities, mm. and that's when it can kind of get problematic from a moral perspective. I guess that's similar to the example you gave earlier of the help, um, you know, someone that grew up in the South, uh, prior, prior to, uh, the sixties, you know, if that, if that person grew up with racism, you know, you find 70 and 80 and 90 year old people now that even though the world has moved to a place where we now have a black president, they still have that deep embedded racism because they learned it at such a young age and it was locked down. Is that kind of the same, the idea of what you're talking about? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You kind of learn those basic uh, vectors of contamination, you know, interpersonal, moral, or, or with food. And then um, once they're acquired, um, they can be hard to shake. Mm. Uh, mm. And, and, and and what's interesting about all of this is that what, what we're talking about is largely an, an effective or emotional system. Mm. Um, rather than a cognitive one, that these things are often um, experienced, the, the repulsion or the, 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 gut, in, the gut feeling of, of uh, wanting to push something away because it's contaminating is felt kind of in the gut almost pre-cognitively. Mm-hmm. And so therefore it makes it um, a bit harder to change, I would argue, um, a bit less out of our rational control. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's one of the interesting things that I talk about in the book is how disgust psychology, contamination psychology is often governed by what is called magical thinking. Um, the, the laws that we reason about with contam- about contamination often defy logic. And so <laughs> uh, logic often goes missing when, this de- when purity psychology gets deployed. Um, we might talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, I'm glad you brought that up with contamination psychology. It's kind of from from the way I was reading in the book. It's it's uh, kind of falls under discuss psychology, but it is distinct from it. And you gave a couple of different examples um, that I thought were great. The the bug juice and the poop shaped brownies. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Can can you talk a little bit about that? People are scratching their heads right now. Poop shaped brownies. What the heck are they talking about? Exactly. Can, this, can you hey, unpack this is, that? <laughs> this is theological uh, innovation at best. If we can bring poop shaped brownies into a conversation about the Christian faith, then we take those pop- to your next potluck at church, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, this is what you get by interviewing a psychologist rather than a theologian. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, okay. I'm going to tell you, Richard. I'm going to correct you there because you you, you might not be a uh, uh, in your mind you might not be a theologian, but in my mind you definitely are. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Well, again, this goes back to Paul Rosen's um, um, work, and, and his argument is that you know this, the the Latin for the word disgust actually means um, distasteful, hmm. but um, there are lots of things that are distasteful that aren't. Uh, disgusting. Uh, disgust is this kind of um, almost, you know, visceral response. It makes makes us feel nauseous. It, it's, it causes us to wrinkle our nose. It can make us even vomit. And so, to get to that point, we're talking about something more than than just something that tastes bad in the mouth. It has to be kind of appraised as a as a contaminant. 
And so contamination in psychology is, is kind of what pushes something over into this kind of realm of disgust. And Rosen has uh, documented a variety of kind of appraisals. And these are, by appraisals, I mean kind of uh, judgments that are made that kind of uh, decide when something is or is not, you know, contaminated. And so, you know, one of them is um, he'll uh, you know, put a bug uh, in juice and um, take the bug out and offer the juice to people. And um, and obviously they won't drink it because the, the bug has come into contact with uh, the juice. But then what he'll do, and I've done this with my own students, is he'll filter it. And he'll boil it, he'll filter it again. And, and we know rationally that the, the filtering process, the sanitation, the sanitation process has, has cleaned it. But still, people will not drink the juice. Mm. Um, even though logically they know it's been clean, there seems to be an appraisal of what he calls permanence, that once it's contaminated, it's always contaminated. Mm. Uh, and again, that's, that's one of the, to, to make a quick a- application, it's one of those things that makes reasoning about morality through the idiom of purity uh, problematic, because the, because the psychology of purity has this attribution of permanence. It's, it's kind of a, you can't rehabilitate something once it's contaminated. Mm-hmm. You know, once you pull the hair out of your spaghetti at the restaurant, there's nothing that can be done. It's, it's yeah. ruined. Um, and so it's a very catastrophic judgment to make. To call something polluted is mm-hmm. to render it almost unsalvageable. And what's interesting about that is, is I talk about in the book, is, is that we don't reason about all moral infractions through the idiom of purity, but the one we do um, almost exclusively is sexual purity. Mm. We, you know, we don't talk about uh, materialism through the idiom of purity. We don't talk about honesty through the idiom of purity. Uh, we tend to reason about those more moral failures as like a fa- performance failures. I made a mistake. But sexual um, sins are, are, are explicitly considered purity issues, mm. which means that if you lose your virginity, um, the attribution of permanence kicks in. It's, mm. a, it's a catastrophic loss that can't be re- rehabilitated. Um, and we don't think about any other sins very much like that. Um, yeah, you, you're right. It, it seems like, <clears throat> especially in evangelicalism, that there is this premium put on virginity and and the true love waits movement, for instance, there's this premium put on virginity to the point of where if someone does end up having premarital sex, it's like they're damaged goods. Um, you know, they they go down the food chain so that you know no upstanding respectable person is going to want to spend the rest of their lives with that person. And it really it really seems like that's a very dangerous move on the part of a faith that talks about forgiveness and repentance and cleansing and all these kinds of things. Yeah, particularly when that that cleansing and repentance is available for just about every other kind of sin. I mean, mm-hmm. see, if you and I go to the store this afternoon and overspend, you know, you know, we we engage, we, we indulge this sin of materialism. We probably spent mm-hmm. more money on ourselves than we should have. You know, we're not going to come home and go, "Oh my gosh, I have lost my materialism <laughs> for the rest." <laughs> life. You know what I mean? We don't think about it in that catastrophic terms. But um, but all that to say is, I mean, there's many reasons why perhaps, you know, we, we've kind of regulated sex with this this metaphor. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the reasons why I would say is because it's one of the, it's one of the, um, well, all I will say is that one of the reasons why I think that sexual sins have been so stigmatized is because of the almost exclusive use of this psychology to regulate it, Mm, Um, mm. this non-rehabilitative, catastrophic um, uh, psychology. And so um, this is actually one illustration of, I think, where purity psychology leads us astray. Mm. Um, I mean, so that's just one example of of contamination appraisals. The the poop shake brownies, we probably need to explain that. Um, (laughs) Somebody's still scratching their head right now. (laughs) Right. But what Rosen will do is he'll he'll bake brownies in the shape of feces, or he will do an, another one I've done with my students is he'll get a sterile, clean bedpan and he'll pour lemonade <laughs> into it, and he'll ask people 
to drink the lemonade out of the bedpan. And, and again, they know. They know it's a sterile <laughs> bedpan, and they know it's just lemonade, but they still won't do it. It just, does, it just looks too much like urine in a bedpan. And even though they know it's a brownie, even if it's shaped like a you know, dog poop, they're not going to eat it either. And that's an example of the attribution of similarity, that mm. if something looks like a contaminant, even if we rationally know it is not the contaminant, still there's some deep affective gut reaction that makes it hard for us to go forward with it. And I think that's, you know, c- coming back to the Gospels, I think that's the problem that the Pharisees had with Jesus, is, is his similarity to, to sinners. He did not look like a holy person. Mm. Um, he was spending time with, you know, tax collectors and sinners. On one occasion, they accused him of not fasting enough, and he's eating and drinking, and so he looks like a drunkard and a, you know, uh, I think I, I recall as being a wine bibber. I'm not sure what yeah. wine bibber is, but I think that's King James language. Someone that doesn't wear their bib when they're drinking, right. I guess. <laughs> yeah. The point is, Jesus doesn't, because he hangs out with sinners, he looks like a sinner. Mm. Um, he doesn't look like the upright, righteous folk of his time. And so, again, there there's another example of this kind of contamination logic creeping into judgments about human beings, leading them astray. And I think a lot of people who live kind of missional lifestyles, like if you and I, you know, are in a bar, to a lot of conservative Christians, that's enough for the attribution of similarity to kick in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's because you are, it, it, what that looks like um so uh, that's just another example. So permanent similarity. And one other, I think, that if I can quickly mention, is uh, sure. negativity dominance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's actually, I was, I, I was getting that. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Negativity dominance, I think, is one of the most critical ones because, um, what, what in, again, in the, in, in when psychologists look at this, what they'll do is they'll take like, something like an apple and, fe- and feces. Now, when I do this with my students, it's actually a Tootsie Roll, um, but I don't tell them that. So they, so, uh, uh, and they'll, and you, if you bring the, the, the food stuff and the contaminant like feces or a bug or something together, um, it, it renders the food stuff, um, inedible. And so what it, that's, the, that's where the term negativity dominates comes in the negative, the pollutant dominates over the, the pure. Uh, all the power is with the contaminant. And, interestingly, it's not a bi-directional relationship. The food stuff doesn't render the feces edible. It's a one-directional, catastrophic association. Um, but what that means is, is that as we reason about the pure and the polluted, if we, if we kind of default to our natural intuitive psychology about the way this should work, it suggests that in the moment of contact between the church and the world, um, that the power resides with the world, that the, the, mm. the church will become contaminated. And that's what the Pharisees are doing in, in Matthew 9, right? They they see Jesus in contact with tax collectors and sinners, and they assume that the power sits with the tax collectors and sinners, that Jesus is the one becoming contaminated. And it doesn't mm. even occur to them that Jesus is bringing light into a dark place. And And I would argue that the Pharisees actually are kind of thinking through this from a fairly logical perspective. Mm. I mean, they're, they're, they're reasoning through the Indian of purity, but one of the fascinating things about the Gospels is how Jesus kind of reverses the vector of contamination. You know, anytime, like the woman with the blood disease or the leper, um, you know, these unclean people touch Jesus, and, and the logic of contamination suggests that he should become unclean. Mm. Um, but he doesn't, and they become purified. And I would argue that that reversal sits, is the challenge you know, of the missional church. Can we grasp that reversal, or are we going to cut default into this kind of uh, naive, instinctive, and unreflective purity judgment that, that only recommends withdrawal mm. um, from the world? And I, I think it, in that attribution of negativity dominance lies a great story of what happens to the church uh, when yeah. we fail to uh, welcome other people. You know, Richard, uh, I think this, I think that's such an important point. I remember I, I grew up in a conservative Southern Baptist church and I remember actually being taught this in my youth group. I remember being taught that um, they actually used the illustration 
they put like a one of the really large members of our youth group on the floor and then one of the small and skinny youth mem- youth members um standing up and trying to pull up the 200 pound guy you know that's a 16 year old uh-huh. and they and their their illustration was look how easy it is for the world to pull you down it's a lot easier for the world to pull you down than for you to pull the world up therefore you should basically quarantine yourself away from the influences of the world and don't get close to people, you know, who smoke, who chew or who go with girls that do. And, um, you know, as, as I was reading about this, the, the negativity dominance, it's kind of, it's kind of hit me. It's like, what did we ever do with the scripture in first John where it says, you know, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. It's like, it seems like Jesus and the disciples had the exact opposite, um, belief uh, as what we're taught with the negative negativity dominance that's prevalent in the evangelical church, at least in the conservative wing. Oh yeah, I mean, I think in, in it, it just breeds a kind of um, fear mm. uh, of the world. And I would argue in the book, I even go further than that. It's not just a fear of being contaminated, um, uh, but but when we start seeing other people as vectors of contamination, it begins a process of dehumanization. Mm. Um, so, I mean, that's a really bad place for the church to be, is, is mm-hmm. the great of the world um, and also uh, dehumanizing um, uh, other people, their neighbors. And I, and I think we've seen the effects of that, you know, across large portions of Christian culture, you know, mm-hmm. how that played out. Um, and it's just not a good, I mean, it, it's just not a Jesus-shaped community. Mm-hmm. Um Know, the, the, the Jesus who came with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. It's, that witness is lost um, in that behavior. Well, you know, you, you say in the book, which I, I thought was just ties right into here, if sin is contagious, extending hospitality becomes impossible. It's impossible for us to open our door if we think that when we open our door that we're going to somehow be polluted or contaminated by that sinner. Um, you, you move into the next section of the book talking about purity and you talk about metaphors in the church and, and, uh, how we use metaphors and the danger of having single dominant metaphors. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, and what you see as the dominant metaphor within the church? The, yeah, that at this point I'm, uh, I'm now borrowing from work from, uh, George Lakoff linguist and, and his argument is that, um, you know, abstractions are very hard for us to kind of get our heads around. So what we end up doing is ground them in more concrete, often very physical uh, metaphors. Uh, so like when a, when a boyfriend and girlfriend say they broke up, we use this idea that the relationship was like an object that could be, you know, broken. Hmm. Um, and in some ways those metaphors are helpful. They help us get our heads around um, abstractions, but they also can hide things. Um, if we think relationships can be broken, then um, the what's entailed by that metaphor is that the relationship might be fixed. Mm. And in, in some ways, you know, the idea of fixing a relationship makes sense, but it also is kind of very kind of technical. And perhaps a better metaphor might not be fixing a relationship, but healing a relationship. Mm. It, it suggests that that might take a longer, slower, gradual process you know, rather than coming there and just, you know, fix this, fix that. Um, and, and so Christians, I think, try to understand their experience through metaphors. And so one of the things I spend time in the book is kind of thinking through the way we think through sin and salvation. And I have this long list of all the different metaphors of how we understand what it means to be lost. Well, that's a metaphor in itself, right? You know, <laughs> um, being lost. So there's this kind of navigational metaphor. So I'm lost versus found, or we have optical metaphors, like I am blind, but now I can mm. see, or uh, I was in the dark, and now I've uh, seen the light, or I was dead, and now I'm alive, and um, we are at war with God, but now we're at peace. We were enemies, now we're friends. We um, were aliens, and now we are, you know, co-heirs and citizens, and so on. You know, just, if you just go through Scripture, just the metaphors just cascade over you. 
Um, but the one that we seem to default to the most, um, and, I, and again, I think it's because it's natural, is, is the idea of um, uh, cleanliness, uncleanliness, or purity and, and uh, pollution. That, that seems to be the metaphor that, that gets privileged um, more than any. And I, I think mainly because, and, and again, it's a biblical metaphor, um, obviously. Although I would argue that Jesus radically reconfigures what purity looks like uh, in the mm. New Testament. Um, in that debate with the Pharisees, Matthew 9, when he talks about mercy and sacrifice, one of the things I argue in the book is that Jesus is fundamentally rethinking what purity looks like, what mm. holy looks like. Um, holiness doesn't look like what the Pharisees think it should look like. Um, Pharisees think it, look, it look, should look like um, moral quarantine. And Jesus is saying, no, it should should look like radical embrace. But all that to say is I think we default to the purity metaphor because it's innate. Mm. Um, and there, and there's, um, there's, just, there's just something, I think, in our primitive experience of being children and being dirty and, and our, our coming in with dirty clothes and being cleaned up and taking baths. Um, if you're a Freudian, for any Freudians listening to the podcast today, um, Freud would trace it back to the you know, toilet training, um, that the, the first kind of real big moral imperative that was put upon us um, was to, you know, learn to go to the bathroom. And, and if you failed to, you made a mess. And we still consider making a mess of our lives. Kind of that's old, if you're a Freudian, that's old potty training language. Hmm. All I have to say is, um, I think we kind of default to the purity metaphor just because it's easy for us to think about morality in that way. Mm. Um, but my argument in the book is if that becomes the exclusive metaphor, then what we're going to do is import all this other dangerous stuff for, about purity psychology that we've already kind of talked about, and there's more, um, into the life of the church. And if we're not reflective, if we don't balance out those those metaphors with other ones, I think we end up becoming somewhat lopsided. And I think in, in all the atonement debates that we've had over the last mm-hmm. many decades is, is about that, about uh, coming up with a more balanced set of metaphors than exclusively, you know, one dominant metaphor, uh, or a crime punishment metaphor, or, a, um, or whatever have you. Yeah, we. I guess for probably three years now on the podcast, we've been kicking against penal substitution, um, because that that was, of course, the dominant metaphor that both Steve and I, my co-host, uh, grew up with and have since come to understand the atonement in a radically different way. Uh-huh. And you said something in the book that I found fascinating. I just wanted to see, see if you could unpack it a little bit. You say that you think that uh, penal substitutionary atonement might be a theological sweet tooth. Can you unpack that for us? Yeah, um, uh, a lot. When you look at um, the, the, the kind of sermons and the, the stories that we tell and the anecdotes we tell, and you ask yourself, why, why do these things catch on in the culture? Um, uh, Richard Dawkins coined the idea of a meme, you know. I don't know if you know about the meme. Yeah. You know, meme is kind of like a, this kind of cultural... Uh, a product, a story, a joke, or an idea, or a song, or something, and, and, and so the question a lot of you know a lot of psychologists and cultural anthropologists you know wonder about what what makes a meme sticky, what makes it propagate uh, or catchy. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book, I think it's called The Tipping Point, and he talks about you know memes being kind of sticky; they kind of catch and they take off and then reach a tipping point and and, and kind of you know, go out to the larger culture. And so I, I've kind of wondered about that from a theological point of view. Like, what is it that makes different theological um, ideas uh, resonate so easily and so quickly? Uh, and so my, my thought here is, is that one of the reasons why penal substitutionary atonement became so ascendant is because it, it, it appealed to certain psychological mechanisms that just made it very salient, very impactful. Um, you can tell a really good story that kind of gets the idea across. I don't know how many stories you sat through as a young, young person about you know, these, these life and death stories. You know, somebody's dying and then somebody makes this heroic rescue and then, and then um, 
that's you know that's connected to what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, right. we're and that's just a, you know, and these 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 are just really memorable stories, and so they stick in the mind. So for they transmit. And one preacher tells them, and they're memorable. So another person repeats them, and they get repeated on and on. And so, um, so the idea here is that it's similar to a sweet tooth. Um, where not all foods appeal to us the same way. We don't crave carrots uh, the way we might crave a donut. Um, and so I think different theological ideas uh, might be sweeter uh, and because they appeal to certain kind of innate psychological mechanisms or, or emotional systems. Mm-hmm. I think penal substitutionary atonement has that. Mm-hmm. It's very emotionally impactful, as we know. Um, I, I think that's the only reason, you know, it, it's very rhetorically powerful if presented well. Um, I think we can all think back to our young adulthood when that metaphor has been used to great effect to motivate yeah. people. And I, so, so, um, so I think that's one of the reasons why it's so powerful. But the sweet tooth here is also a judgment because if you just eat donuts all the time, you're going to get obese and not be healthy. And I think the same thing is <laughs> true here. There, there is something emotionally powerful about that metaphor, um, you know, that you have been rescued from death. That's a really powerful metaphor. But if you just constantly indulge that idea, I think you're going to get a really lopsided theology, particularly when you start asking questions about, why does God want to kill me? Um, yeah. Why does he have to kill anybody? Um, and it's, it, 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 when you get behind the emotional rhetoric of it, then you start running all those theological problems that leave you with a really unsatisfactory view of who God is. Don't, don't you think that's a result of pushing the metaphor too far and turning it into like a mechanistic transaction instead of just um, catching, you know, it's like what you were talking about with the relationships being broken and fixed. It's like you can glean something from that metaphor, but when you push it too far, it just it becomes very unhelpful. I mean, don't don't you think that's kind of the way PSA is? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think you, just the fair mere fact that you and I are recognizing it as a metaphor is progress. Yeah, not, definitely. Yeah, not as like an ontological truth. There's many that it, don't they, right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, that's what you're saying is that people have kind of reified the metaphor and treated the metaphor as as as, as a kind of moral law or calculus mm. that must be set, or rather that um, rather than seeing it as a bit of poetry. Um, mm. And I would argue, if you look at the metaphors I kind of list in the book and, and more in Scripture, what you're seeing is, is, is uh, are the biblical authors using almost any metaphor at their disposal to try to communicate something that probably cannot be communicated adequately. So that, mm. yes, to reduce it to the, a one metaphor and then turn that metaphor into a mechanism, I think, is... is uh, um, inherently going to shut out all sorts of truth claims. Um, but also, like you said, um, created a kind of an unbalanced approach. Yeah, um, yeah, very much. Yeah. You, uh, in, in talking about purity, you, you move from that into the idea of hospitality. And I tell you, Richard, one of the most uh, profound things from your book uh was was something that you were kind of gleaning, I think, from Walter Brueggemann's research. Um, And you were talking about the prophetic versus the priestly tradition and how Jesus, you know, we've been we've been taught as people who grew up, uh, you know, I grew up in a conservative evangelical home and have since moved way, way in a different direction. But in growing up that way. Um, you know, you, you're taught this flat inerrancy of the Bible where everything is equally valid and everything's equally true. And so somehow you have to rec- you have to reconcile um, some of the things from Leviticus with some of the things from the prophets, which seem to undermine some of the Levitical law. Uh, can you talk about this tension between the priestly and prophetic and and uh, tell us kind of how you see Jesus uh, walking this out? Yeah, um, yeah Brueggemann's argument is is that. Um, and I, he's not the only one that makes this argument, but, but is, is that as you read the Old Testament, there is this tension, this conversation or debate um, 
that the Bible is having with itself. So you have the kind of Levitical tradition where the holiness and, and set-apartness of God um, is, is, is primary. So you just read the book of Leviticus and you, know, you, get, you get this sense of that, that God is holy and set-apart, and if you infringe upon that at all, then the bad things are going to happen. And then you get into the prophets, and there is this kind of rebellion against that or criticism of that where God starts mm. saying, you know, I hate, I despise your religious feasts and your festivals. And Isaiah talks about true, what is true fasting? And true fasting is showing mercy. And so there is this tension between the, the, the Levitical pursuit of kind of cultic purity before God, moral purity before God, and this prophetic call uh, to welcoming um, the, the orphan and the widow and the alien, the one being the poor that are being um, trampled on at the gate. And he argues um, that that uh, debate uh, carries, is not resolved in the Old Testament, and it carries forward into the New Testament. In, in, in the life of Israel, you, there is still this tension about what does it really mean to be upright or righteous before God. And so one way of reading debate between Jesus and the Pharisees in places like Matthew 9, where you're seeing both impulses on display, okay? Here are these outcasts, the, the tax collectors and sinners, and the Levitical impulse would say quarantine and expulsion, and that's what the Pharisees do. They stand on the outside. But Jesus crosses that boundary and embraces them in this active table fellowship, which, which back in that culture would recognize just recognize their fundamental equality and dignity and status in the community. I mean, that's the biggest thing you can do to kind of recognize the humanity of another person is eat with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus does this radical thing, and it was one of the most provocative things that he did. Um, and what he does is he cites the prophetic tradition to justify what he's doing. He quotes Hosea 6.6 6 and says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And sacrifice here is the entire sacrificial system. Mm. Of, of temple purity and cultic purity. And says so at the end of the day, um, Jesus says, uh, God will cast his vote with the people of mercy. Mm. And that means the boundary crossers um, who embrace the unclean. And that is what Jesus does. Um, he doesn't quarantine himself like the Essenes out in the desert and, you know, um, and he doesn't do, do what the Pharisees do. He engages in this kind of radical table fellowship with everybody and anybody, and even the Pharisees themselves. He eats, you know, he eats with. Um, he, he's almost indiscriminate in who he'll break bread with. Um, so, yeah, I would argue that, that that tension is carried forward in the New Testament, and that Jesus kind of privileges um, the prophetic call over the Levitical call. Um, or I would argue probably perhaps reinterprets the Levitical tradition. That's what I would say. Uh, you, you would, I would argue that what Jesus is doing is saying what, what, what makes one pure in the eyes of God and holy um, is being a person of mercy. That is what holiness... How, that's how we will define holiness from here on out. Holiness isn't about um, this moral piety that you pursue in private. It is rather about embracing other people. That's what holiness looks like. It looks like mm. Jesus. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, that's the fascinating thing is this, this juxtaposition that you put in the book talking about mercy and sacrifice and how, you know, we really have been taught that those things are to coexist. It's almost like, you know, uh, it's almost like grace and the law, you know, it's like we, right. we want yeah. to hold on to the hand of both. And it's, it really does seem like Jesus cast his lot with that prophetic tradition. And, I've heard this, Richard. I don't know if you've heard this or not, but I, I've never actually researched it. But I've actually heard that Hosea 6.6 6 was the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament, which I, oh, I, yeah. just, I, I found that fascinating. I thought, wow, that's, uh, that kind of just reaffirms that that's the, the trajectory of the New Testament. Yeah. Well, it, one of the things that you just said that, that I want to grab onto, and I kind of argue in the book, is, yeah, a lot of people think that... Um, you can have both. Um, and I would say, yeah, insofar as you can have both, you can have both. But, but it's, what's interesting is Jesus doesn't say, he, he could have said something less radical. Jesus could mm. have said, God desires mercy and sacrifice. Mm. 
um, which is which is you know which would have been an olive branch to the Pharisees, or even or even more than or even yeah. more than sacrifice. But he 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 he, he cites a, a really something pretty pretty exclusionary, you know, is our mercy and, and not sacrifice. Mm. Wow. And what I do in the one of the things I do in the book is I, I try to describe why mercy and sacrifice are actually not just two random virtues that come into conflict in that story. They actually are reciprocally related psychological processes. They're they're actually the same psychology at work, just one side or the other. And that, that's why it's so difficult to implement that, that kind of classic mantra of, you know, just love the sinners but hate the sin. You know, you hear that. You can have it both ways. Um, what I argue is that, that in, in practice, psychologically, that is actually really difficult to do, mm. which is why we see Christian communities fail with that approach. I don't think talk we're, about we, that a little bit. Can you unpack that, what you, what you mean by that? Well... Um, I think what we do is we think we can separate um, our effective feelings about human beings from our attitudes about their behavior. Mm. Um, uh, that I can have this hatred of what they do, but yet somehow not think as possibly to psychologically keep those feelings from blurring into my feelings about them as human beings, you know, their intelligence or their moral fiber, you know. Um, mm. Clearly, if these people are engaged in these kind of activities, there's got to be something kind of wrong with them. That's that process of dehumanization I was talking about earlier. Mm. You know, when you start hating and loathing those behaviors and seeing those behaviors as contaminants, it, it's almost impossible to keep those from actually affecting the way we feel about those people. Mm. You, know, and, you know, quote, unquote, those people, um, whatever, that, whatever that sin is. Um, and, and so and I try to describe that in the in the book about why I think that might be the case. I think that might be one of the more provocative aspects of the book where I argue that it might actually be impossible psychologically to hate um, the sinners. I mean, hate the sin, but love the sinners. And that at the very least, if I'm, even if I'm wrong about that, at the very least, um, that just thinking that you can throw that idea out there... Um, as adequate to the challenge of what it, what you actually have to accomplish in your heart to really love people you disagree with, we're not equipping people for how mm. how how actually really hard it is to really disagree about behaviors and really really truly love them as individuals. Because mm. here's my suspicion. Uh, I'll, I'll, this is uh, let me say something provocative. Have Please do. <laughs> yeah, I I will. I would argue. That, that, that many conservative Christians know I'm right about that. They, mm. they might not admit it, you know, but they know I'm right because they know that any, I, I bet they know deep in their heart that if we start displaying any softness to those people, mm. that it's a slippery slope. Wow. Uh, does it make sense? They know that the minute you soften towards mm. these people's individuals, mm. and they know downstream our ability to rail against their sin will be compromised because mm. they are no longer those people, but they are friends and loved ones. Mm. It's curious to me because whenever I ask crowds, whenever I ask people, I say, how many of you ever heard the, the idea of love, you know, love this sin or hate this sin? Everybody's heard it. And then I say, how many of you actually think that's possible, mm. you know, like psychologically possible to pull off? And most people think it's possible. And then mm. I say, well, give me an example. Like, give me an example in your own life where you've felt like you've been able to do this. And invariably, people give me an example of a loved one. They say, my brother is an alcoholic, and I hate what the alcoholism is doing to him. You know, but it, it's my, you know he's my brother. They, they never give examples of, like, the culture wars. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they always give examples of there's somebody I love, my brother, my spouse, my child, who's gotten to this sin, and I hate what that sin is doing to their life. But, you know, at the end of the day, they're my brother. They're my mm -hmm. child. They're my mm -hmm. spouse. And, and that's, kind of, um, that's kind of what I'm talking about in the book, is, is that um, 
that we have to somehow get to the point where we can secure that love first. Mm. Or we, you know, treat everybody as a brother and a sister. And if we can secure that first, then maybe we can get to the issue of the, the things in our lives that are killing us. Because that conversation will not be dehumanizing because, you know, I love you, and that is beyond question. Mm. Uh, Miroslav Volf calls that uh, the will to embrace, that mm. it, it is the, the will to embrace somebody that precedes any other conversation or judgment, that, that mm. at the end of the day, that is secured first, and only then can you proceed to the moral um, conversation. But mm. what happens, I think, in the church is that we begin with the moral conversation and say, clean up your act first, and mm. then we will recognize your humanity. Then you'll be one of us. And we get it backwards. And so what ends up happening is we just end up dehumanizing people who we morally disagree with. And they feel it. They know it. They know we don't like them. Wow. Wow. So they, can, they can sense the, the hostility behind it all. Um, it's all couched in good language. This is God's will for you. You know what I mean? It's, but at the end of the day, they know you just don't like us. Wow. Golly. You know, Richard, that has so many implications on so many different levels. I mean, one that's one that's kind of ringing in my head as you're saying that is thinking about um, our treatment of people of other faiths, um, because uh-huh. we have so it's so been ingrained in us that, you know, you can love the Muslim, but you have to hate Islam. You have to you have to hate what it stands for. You have to hate the Quran. You have to hate all of these things. Um, or else, you know, somehow you're going to transgress the boundary that keeps us pure. And it seems like with what you're saying that it's impossible, even in that discussion, it's impossible to even, um, abhor the beliefs of other people because in doing so you'll demonize that other person. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I know what I'm saying here and I know it sounds crazy, but, uh, but I think there is. I mean, I, I would think empirically that's true. I mean, if you abhor yeah. something and then find a person associated with it, you, you have to be really hard pressed to convince me that somehow you could meet that person with a magnanimous, open, empathic, loving, patient, and gracious heart. You know what I mean? Mm. I mean, to me, I, I can't imagine you, you. Anybody could say I can. I can pull that off. I yeah. can have a whore, you know. But but when I come across the Muslim, I radiate <laughs> nothing but grace <laughs> and 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 kindness and and a, and a patience. I'm not tense or anxious at all, and and they would not know that I abhor. You know, I, I, that's what I'm saying. I I, I just seem. It seems like to me that what people are articulating in this love, the sinner hate the sin thing, it sounds to me just wildly and psychologically implausible. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that's a provocative thing to say, but I, I, I would argue that that uh, I've very rarely seen it put into practice. I, I think you're I think you're 110 percent right because I think of my own life when I've tried to do that. Somehow you always you always end up extending less love to that person um, than what you verbalize. You know, you always, in, in your heart, you always reserve something. You hold something back um, that you don't hold back with your, with your brother or your sister. Because you, like you said, with a, you know, with the, with the drunk uncle who, that you gave the example of, you've already established that will to embrace because he's your uncle. Um, and therefore his behavior is, is secondary. And it seems like that's a really hard thing for us to do with anything other than family, which kind of raises the question of, you know, Jesus, the way that Jesus looked at familial relationships, because it seems like he really undermined the nuclear family. And it seems like evangelicalism that the trumpet of evangelicalism is preserving the nuclear family. And yet Jesus seems to completely deconstruct that whole concept so that he looks at a room full of people when his uh, mom and his brothers are outside waiting. And he says, that's not my mom and brothers. All of you are my mom and brothers. You know, that, that, 
every that the family of God is this huge, inclu- all inclusive, encompassing thing that somehow we've got to wrap our minds around. But it seems like Richard, we've been conditioned to do the exact opposite. Yeah, it's. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it produces kind of a. It's a very, it's a very tribal um, in group yeah. um, psychology that gets activated there mm. and creates that. In the, in the book, that process of dehumanization is called infrahumanization. It's when we see other groups as kind of less than human. They, they lack some kind of essential quality that mm. defines in-group. And, it, and it's often like intelligence. They're not as smart as we are, um, or virtue. They're just not as you know, good as we are. Mm. Uh, and... Um, but yeah, Jesus seems to expand what uh, Peter Singer calls the moral circle. He just has, he, he seems to live in a world that doesn't have any strangers, and he extends this kind of kinship language universally. Um, and, I, and I would argue, going back to what we said earlier about the Eucharist, I'd argue that's kind of what was signaled in his practice of table fellowship, that kind mm-hmm. of extension of kinship language. Um, to everybody, because kind of the root of kindness is kin. You know that, that mm, the book wow. I say, are, in the book I say, our um, our our affections follow our, our ontology. You know, whoever is of the same kind as I am, that's who. Who you know, those who are the same kind are my kin, and those are the ones that get kindness, mm. um, the feelings of kinship, and and so Jesus extends that language. He extends the family language seeing all of us as of the same kind, of, of the same family, and therefore kindness flows not just to the in-group, but to everybody, like Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, right? If you just greet, if you just extend kindness to your brother or your sister, you know, what great moral demonstration is that? Everybody does that. Hmm. Um, and so, uh, he, he, yeah, he does. He breaks those boundaries down um, to create this universal family. Not to belabor the point, but it really seems like, you know, as we're talking, all of the sudden, I think about that scripture, you know, where Jesus says, unless you hate your father and mother and brother and sister, et cetera, um, then you're not you're not fit to be part of the kingdom. It makes me wonder if that whole hatred of the nuclear family is all about this. It's the idea that you have to hate those distinctions and embrace a kingdom family um, as opposed to. Because really, the nuclear family is all about it's this whole thing that we're talking about with boundary monitoring. You know, if you're blood related, if you're kin, then you're in, and if not, well, then you're a stranger, and you might be welcomed into the circle, but you've got to prove yourself first. You've got to the the will to embrace is not a given. Um, that just I don't know for me that just all of a sudden makes some things click. So thank you for that. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> Um, You talk about, under this hospitality section, the whole idea of selfhood. And I know uh, Michael Harden has really challenged me with with, um, something that uh, Rene Girard uh, coined the phrase or the term interdivisual, that there was no such thing as an individual, but there's only interdivisuals. And you talk about how the selfhood itself, selfhood itself is a boundary, and how the self gets symbolically extended. Can you... Can you explain that for us? Yeah, I, I think this is where it starts kind of bumping up against some of that uh, material in the Slavery of Death um, series. But yeah, so uh, Disgust is a boundary monitoring psychology that, that, that initially um, monitors the the borders of the physical body. That's the Dixie Cup experiment. You know, if anything crosses the threshold of my, my, my physical body, it becomes foreign and alien. I don't want to reincorporate reincorporate it. But you know, humans are symbolic creatures and so the the myself is not just my physical body, but it's like my home. You know, if you come into my home, this is that's in my space, um, my church, my country. And so these things that are considered mine, they become kind of symbolic extensions of the self. And so what happens is the psychology of boundary monitoring um, extends into those spaces as well. So we monitor the borders of our country, making sure like immigrants don't come in and contaminate, you know, the work pool, you know, the workforce. Or mm. um, I don't want a gay teacher um, in my school. 
mm. with my kids because, again, the school where my kids are raised, that's a very sacred space, so I don't want to contaminate in there. Mm. I don't want a homeless person who stinks in my house, you mean, or or um, people in my church. or so, so the idea there is, is that this kind of boundary monitoring, uh, this hypervigilance about the, the, the contaminating other gets extended symbolically to the to these other places that are symbolically represented as mine or my spaces. Um, and so the self here becomes this very distributed property. It's not just mm-hmm. in my head. It's this any, any location that I identify as mine um, and give it some sort of sacred value. So it's church, it's the nation, um, uh, schools, um, my home. You know, those are the the typical the sacred spaces that we kind of monitor with this psychology. My neighborhood, you know, you don't want those people moving yeah. around. That kind of thing. Anything, anything that impinges upon, you know, my my selfhood. So the idea here is kind of a distrib- distributed self, and then how the boundary monitoring extends past the boundaries of the body. Mm. You talk about uh, with this, with with the whole selfhood, that we experience love as a boundary issue, and that love involves a suspension of disgust and contamination sensitivity. Um, so that love is all about tearing down the boundaries between people. Um, and he gave some fascinating examples of this. I mean, things that I had not even really thought about before that are so obvious, like for instance, just a, just a relationship, um, between a husband and wife, you know, uh, to, to stick your tongue in someone else's mouth is a very disgusting thing. And then all of a sudden that barrier gets broken down when it's a person that you love, you know, right. That I just never even thought of that. But the fact that Love is always experienced as the moving toward the other and that the boundaries become less and less so that literally you are opening all of yourself to that other person. Um, yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's an interesting, that's a, that's a, you might get some interesting conversation uh, on the podcast about that move. Um, because what I'm saying strikes many people as kind of, um, Kind of almost sounds like enmeshment. Um, and, and and you've gotten a lot of pushback on this, from what I understand, yeah, is yeah, in the book. I've, I've got yeah, people, people, psychotherapists, people, kind of very concerned about boundaries. Hearing me kind of talking about this, dismantling the boundaries between the self and the other to create kind of a um, uh, an identification um, with the other um, as as a as, as a healthy. Um, and so I do try to deal with those kind of therapeutic concerns uh, in the book. Um, but, 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 I, but the point I always want to insist upon is, is that um, uh, although I understand that there are times and there are locations where we have to erect boundaries between self and other, uh, we have to say no uh, to others um, to provide space or provide seasons of uh, self-care or rehabilitation um, because we will be uh, used up uh, otherwise. I, I kind of want to say being used up is, as best I can tell, what Jesus means by love. Um, and and, and, and I, I'm taking a cue here from the theologian Arthur McGill, and this is where it comes into the Slavery of Death series, that that fear of being used up um, is, is the basic primal fear that causes us to not love others. Mm. Um, and, and so it's not so much that I want to say that the boundaries should never be erected. It, I do just want to always come back to the point that um, to say yes to others is always risky and does involve real self-expenditure, um, it, a saying no to the self. And I think Protestants have a lot of... I think Protestants, I've come to learn have a hard time with this. Catholics less so. Catholics have a great tradition of, of kind of self-mortification. Um, but Protestants see that as very monastic and morbid and unhealthy. Mm. Um, but the Catholic tradition has, has tended to, to have a higher view of expending and wasting the self. I mean, Catholics, you know, live their lives talking about the martyrs. Um, Protestants, not so much. 
Do, do you uh, think? Do you think, Richard, that this might be as a result of the Protestant Reformation happening during the Enlightenment and the exaltation of the individual? I mean, is that? Do you think? That has no, something I would. To do I would with it? Yeah, I would think if you if you read the work of Charles Taylor, um, that's exactly his argument. Because what has happened from the Enlightenment is kind of the exaltation of what he calls the um, the buffered self, the kind mm. of self, the individual that's buffered and has ba- these strong boundaries. And I would argue that's the problem with the church. So when I go to my church, what we have is a bunch of individual cells that, that mm. don't extend themselves for other at all. Um, they don't, you know, that, that uh, Arthur McGill's argument is um, that the, the ethic of our churches in the American culture is to be fine, to have no needs, to, to always be okay and self-sufficient. I mean, the most shameful thing you can express, you know, the thing that would make you most unclean in our culture is to be a needy person emotionally or financially, so we hide our need, um, and so that way we don't have to um, do anything for anybody. You know, mm. we just have donuts and have a good worship service and go on home. Um, and, and so although I, 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 I do hear the criticism about the, the boundary issue, I do think that I'm trying to say something important underneath, which is at some point my boundaries must ex- expand or become dismantled for me to be somewhat, to some degree, poured out for others, mm. to be empty um, mm. in service to others. Um, now, in the slavery of death, uh, I try to respond to that criticism by saying that um, it's not all up to you, because I think that's what people hear. That, that you know, I have to love the world if I'm poured out in love for the world, and if I allow everybody to cross my boundaries, I'll have no time or money or anything left for myself. Um, and that's true, right? You you don't have the capacities to love everybody. Right. Um, and so that's where I talk about the economy of love, um, where we're, what we're called to isn't to love the world all by ourselves, because I think some of us feel that way. I have to, in my own resources, solve world hunger or, you know, but the minute you step out, you realize the need is too great. I can't. I will be used up. So I, I have to pull back. But I think what God is calling us to is is not to save the world all by ourselves, but to participate in economies of love, the kingdom of God, where you see in the end of Acts two and four, where you know there were no needy persons among them. They took care of each other. Um, that that yes, as I am poured out for you, um, you're pouring into me. And, and so, therefore, there is um, that sense of reciprocal sense that, you know, I, I can't expend myself because somebody's taking care of me. I think the reason why we don't expend ourselves is two reasons. One, we think we have to do it all by ourselves, and we know, logically, that will mean using my, using, I will get used up. And two, a lack of trust that anybody will pour back into me. Mm. It, it, but it goes back to the problem of individualism, where mm-hmm. we're still trying to solve the problem as an isolated ego, and we realize we can't do it. Mm. Um, and so, to me, there's kind of a, a fundamental startup problem. You have individuals trying to solve the problem when you, what you need is kind of a kind of a collective action, which is why I think, this is why I'm, I've become re- really recently interested in, in, in groups like intentional monastic communities yeah. and, and um, you know, the, the, these, these, these pe- people who are, are more prone to sharing life together um, I think get closer to kind of what I'm talking about, um, about, about all this. So, um, that's kind of leaking back into kind of the slavery of death stuff. But I do think that idea of dismantling boundaries and being poured out and dealing with the resultant fears of all of that is, is one of the place of connection between these two, two books. You know, I, you, you said, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was sitting here thinking as you were talking about the neo monastic movement and how, it seems like we're trying to we're trying to do what can only be done in community as individuals and i know myself you know as a as a white middle class uh you know rural country dwelling guy um you know i find myself often frustrated going gosh how do i how do i live out these things that jesus taught me because i'm always you know jesus talks about counting the cost you know in your mind you're trying to think how am i going to do this and how am i going to do that and still have time for you know my kids and my wife and myself 
And um, boy, I think you hit the I think you hit the nail on the head. Maybe what we need is a radical reworking and and reimagining of what it even means to to live, of what it even means to, you know, what what our lives should even look like. Yeah, I think it has to have a communal look to it. Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna feel overwhelmed by. Yeah. But I think a lot of us, when we're younger, or even now, if we kind of you know wonder about if we can do it all on our own. And so, I would add this though, and I and I and I added this to the Slavery of Death book, which, by the way, is, is I, I don't know if we mentioned this for the people listening. It was a series on my blog, but um, is, is now under contract and hopefully coming out. I don't know sometime this next year. If I had but, a sound effect with a bunch of cheers and clapping yeah. right now, I would I'd be playing it. So because I'm really excited about that, Richard. Um, I, I've been really, really touched and, and, and a bit overwhelmed by, by how, how people respond to that material. So I, I'm just, uh, it, it was because of encouragement like yours and others that, that has just kind of made me really want to kind of get it off, get it out there as, as quickly mm-hmm. as possible. So thank you for that. But, um, but one of the things I added to the book, just, just by way of help, is just kind of my my, one of my new my new heroes um, is uh, Chere of Lesu, uh and her little way. She's a Catholic saint. Um, and what I like about her little way is 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 uh, she. Um, I don't know if your listeners know who Chere of Lesu was, but she was this young monastic, never left a monastery. And um, after she died, she died of young, I think, tuberculosis. She died and. Um, eventually became one of the most popular saints in the Catholic Church. And and people like Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day and Mother Teresa of Calcutta, you know, like consider themselves disciples of this Mm -hmm. young girl. I think she died when she was like 22 or 23. And uh, and you're kind of like, wow, what did this girl write um, that was so profound? And it's about um, uh, uh, her memoir called The Story of a Soul. And in it, she recounts what she calls this little way and it's it's really a little modest little thing. It's just you know as she lived with with her fellow sisters in this monastery, the way she would just try to open herself herself up in very small ways, uh, modest ways. That's what's called the little way um, to to people who were maybe socially inept or or um, a little bit grumpy, and because of this, they were kind of stigmatized. You know, they weren't the most favorite people to hang out with, but she would kind of take a minute to go sit by that, you know, sister who was a little bit crabby or a little bit dysfunctional or even socially damaged, you know, Mm. and just take a minute to be kind and smile and give an agreeable um, face and, and invite them into conversation, and she would do that, you know, every day, just do these little, you know, act in these little ways. And so, and so that's, that's, you know, Mother Teresa summed up the best because Mother Teresa summed up the little way, which is, you know, we can only do, you know, small things, but we do them with great love. Mm-hmm. And so it's in Dorothy Day was the same way, just, just fidelity to the little acts of kindness. And so I added that to the Slavery of Death series because when everybody, when I ever start talking about this kind of self-expenditure and martyrdom and kenosis, people are like, oh my gosh, you know, I got, you know, I got to go to work and I got to buy <laughs> milk on the way home. And so you're, are you kidding me? You know? Yeah. But then when you re- think about the little way, you can go to work and say, okay, I'm going to open myself up mm. um, to this person in the office that nobody likes. And I'm going to just go over there and say, how was your weekend? You know, just give them a little bit of grace. And and I have discovered if you begin practicing that, you know, that because I think it's an act of hospitality, you know, opening yourself up to welcome another, um, that, 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 that will, that little step will take you great distances. Um, so, I, I, I try to, in the book, kind of come up with something that is that something that we can all do. Mm-hmm. That if we're not going to be, that we can be poured out a little bit more for each other uh, tomorrow than we were today. Mm-hmm. Uh, baby steps, I guess, is the way to think about it. You know, you know, you said in the book when you're talking about hospitality, you said it restores a full human status to the marginalized and outcast, and I think that's exactly what you're talking about. Is just on purpose, intentionally looking for those that are on the margins and reaffirming to them their the you know that they're made in the image of God 
And, and you know, that's so beautiful how you put it, just the little things, you know, because each of us, it doesn't matter who's listening right now, all of us can somehow find not even extra time. <laughs> it's just, just uh, being intentional about how we live our lives. You know, it doesn't yeah. even, like you said, walking over to that person in the <clears throat> office that's annoying or, or that everybody considers as an outcast that doesn't take any extra effort, really. It just takes a decision to say, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love like Jesus loves." I think that's beautiful. Beautiful. Did you, uh, Tere, Saint Tere in her book talks about how uh, uh, you know there might be these disagreeable sisters in the convent, and so people would uh, see them coming and take these detours around mm. them. And I mean, I've done that. You know, I do it yeah. in church. So yeah. if I'm heading down the hall, I'm like, I'm going to take a left here because I don't want to run into that person. And and she. She compares that behavior, this detouring around people, these unlikable people, to a form of persecution. You oh, know, wow. Wow. and uh, she says, you know, you, she says you're subtly persecuting these people, and so that's just one of the things I've tried to do is try to, you know, try to adopt a no detour rule in my life. Mm. And um, uh, yeah, it's hard, brother. Wow. That is the hardest thing. Wow. You, you commit. That's what we should do for Lent. Everybody listening to this podcast, <laughs> commit no detour rule. Oh and my gosh! Extend hospitality to everybody. Uh, I, that would be that'd be a form of self mortification for Lent, wouldn't it? Richard, I, I tell you, as <laughs> as you're saying that, I'm sitting here thinking, like, I'm I'm just imagining. Just yesterday, <laughs> I'm remembering the detour I took from a from a person that that. Uh, Everyone that I, I work in a retail environment and we'll, there's a customer that comes in that every person cringes when they see them come in because they're so demanding and so they transgress every uh, unspoken boundary and border, <laughs> uh, you know, and I was just um, I was just remembering I just did that yesterday. Yeah. And I tell oh, you, I'll do it. I, I tell you, Richard, uh, I think it would be amazing if we at beyond the box, if we as listeners just committed to a no detour campaign, just a campaign of no detour, how hellishly hard and and simple is that at, at the same time? You know. Oh yeah, that, that I mean that's why that's what's amazing about the little way because it's little. It's called little. It's a little thing, but when you contemplate it, oh my gosh! I mean, you're like, I can't. That is that is a heroic task. No doubt. So, yeah, we either came up with the greatest Lenten innovation or I've lost a few <laughs> thousands of podcast listeners. Well, no, you've got us all inspired right now. Yeah, it's just right. that when we get when we get a little closer to Easter, <laughs> yeah. and, well, everybody's you know, going to hate you then. <laughs> you know, and it's, but like you said, it's little things. It's workplace things, they detour, but it's, but it's like it's even humanizing anonymous mm -hmm. interactions in a capitalistic society. Like, mm -hmm. did you see that? Did you see that? Um, that tipping incident with that pastor who, um, that receipt. Uh, no, didn't... no. Uh -uh. Well, there, there was this thing that went around. A bunch of, a bunch of people listen and uh, we'll see this, but, but apparently there was a table of church people and um, the, the because they were a certain size, you know, 10 or more people, they you know, automatically put 18% on the bill like they do. Apparently this pastor was chagrined that they did that. And so he, he axed out the tip, like literally erased the tip, and then wrote, you know, um, I give God, something like, I give God 10%, why do you deserve 18%? Oh, and then, my goodness. Yeah, and then, but, but gave them no tip, and then signed it, pastor so-and-so. And well, the, the server was so chagrined, they took a picture of it and put it on, like, Facebook, and, and it's, it's, it's exploded. So now there's this goodness. huge conversation about Christians being these complete jerks when it comes to tipping other people. Well, you know, it's a known fact, Richard. On, I mean, I've heard this in the in the wait staff community for years that the absolute last time that a waiter or waitress wants to work is during uh, the Sunday lunch hour. Oh, I agree. I, I used to work those. They're awful. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Wow. But. But again, so I guess what I'm saying is, I mean, so so yeah, I mean, you you can be a welcoming person to this person who comes up and wait on you. You know, you can treat yeah. them with 
you know, a little bit of patience or dignity, you know. Right. At least don't write it, you know. Um, you know, the person that's great at this is my wife, Canna. She's, she, she, she routinely isn't, you know, getting checked out by somebody, and it's like a stressful day. You can just tell this person at the end of their wit's end, and everybody's being complete jerks or whatever like that. But she just has this wonderful way of of dealing with this, like, cashier person and just making, like, a nice little comment or something and completely putting them at ease and then mm. having a nice little exchange with them and just, just inserting a bit of humanity in the midst of their kind of pretty brutal work day. And some people are good at that, you know. Um, sometimes I try to joke around and I come off as just kind of an idiot, but Jan is really <laughs> good. Jan is really good at actually humanizing the interaction. And, and, uh, but again, again, those are just little acts of welcome um, mm -hmm. where, you know, um, we can just make, you know, make room for each other and, and, and recognize that, you know, you know, you're, 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 God's child, and I see that. Mm -hmm. That's profound. That's just profound. I, I'm. I, that's just so profound to me. And I, I tell you, I feel like I feel convicted right now because I feel like, for so long, as I've you know, as I've read so many books um, from the neo neo monastic community and looked at so many things, like you know, with with your slavery of death series and talking about the emptying of the self and kenosis and all these things. You know, so many times it seems ethereal. It's like you you know it's true, and yet it seems ethereal. But this is grassroots stuff that really could change the perception of of Jesus. Um, just amazing! Wow, I, I'm I'm blown away. Um, that you talk about hospitality as being politically subversive, and I think we've actually, <laughs> I think right now we're hitting on uh, maybe the the mustard seed in that thought of, of uh, how to be politically subversive and, and how the hospitality is actually a resistance. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, there's been tons of great work written about hospitality. Uh, um, I think it's Christine Pohl, um, uh, her book, um, Making Room, um, is, is a great survey of, the, the history of hospitality in mm. uh, Christian tradition and how, you know, obviously before the rise of what we call the hospitality industry, um, hotels and restaurants where, you know, as I passed through a town, I would go to a hotel and eat at a restaurant and they're all fairly anonymous. You know, but in the ancient world, there weren't hotels and, and, and uh, restaurants that, you know, literally you ate in the homes of other people and, and Christians, um, became known throughout the ancient world as being exemplary in mm. this extending hospitality to to people. Um, and so you even see that in Scripture, you know, the, you know, practice hospitality because some of us are entertaining angels unawares. And so um, the, uh, the, 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 the monasteries uh, became places of hospitality for people sojourning. Um, the rule of St. Benedict is, is um, often pointed to as Kind of the, the pinnacle of monastic hospitality. And there's a whole chapter in the Rule of Benedict about welcoming guests. Whenever you welcome a guest, um, you, you're welcoming Christ. Um, but what's happened, I think, is, is over eons, is that we've kind of outsourced um, all of that work. Um, and so you know, people pay strangers to show them hospitality, so they go to restaurants and hotels. So, so but the whole argument is that, um, is that the act of hospitality, kind of welcoming somebody in, isn't just feeding them and closing them, but it's kind of restoring their place in the community, restoring uh, their dignity. So it's politically subversive because it's going to be ta it's going to take somebody who has been marginalized by the community and, and dehumanized the community and restore them to, to full status. Um, mm. And and that's kind of what Jesus does, right? These tax collectors and sinners, these lepers of society, are not full participants in the community. And so Jesus is actually eating with them, uh, sharing hospitality with them, brings them, kind of reincorporates them, rehabilitates them in this web of mutuality. That, And I think that is the problem. That's the ultimate problem, is that those people are incorporated into the community. Uh, and so there's, so there's something politically subversive about what Jesus is doing. He's just, you know, 
eating a sandwich with these people. He is recognizing them as children of Israel um, on full par with the Pharisees themselves. And I think that's what ultimately uh, becomes um, the, the sticking point. So one application of this uh, in the other, other parts of the New Testament that I talk about in the book is the way the Corinthian church is behaving towards each other. In the Corinthian church, the, the wealthy patrons of the church are um, kind of dishonoring the poor members of the church. And, um, and the rift is occurring in the Eucharist, the Eucharist itself. And so Paul tries to address um, that, that, that problem, the, 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 the factions between the rich and the poor in that church, and encouraging them to, to wait on each other and take the meal together. Um, but in his body metaphor, where he talks about, you know, the eyes, and, you know, I can't say to the foot, I don't need you, and so forth. If you kind of read through that whole metaphor, one of the things he starts talking about is honoring and how the different parts of the body have, diff- have different levels of honor and that the parts that don't have honor, the shameful parts, the disgusting parts, we might say, um, God treats with special honor. And then he's calling the Corinthian church to honor each other, to recognize that the, the poor members of his church, the church, to recognize their humanity. And, and so he's, he's a subverting kind of the status hierarchy of that culture and saying that hierarchy should not be imported into the church. Mm. Um, mm. So those acts of hospitality kind of function as prophetic indictments against the way the world honors um, and, and the way the, uh, the world kind of allocates the winners and the losers, um, the, the top dogs and the bottom dogs. Mm-hmm. And hospitality, welcoming those at the bottom, um, subverts that. Mm. And, and and all of this talk about kind of breaking down boundaries and and embracing the other, the question inevitably arises, you know, that group identity is defined by boundaries. You talk about that in the book. And you ask the question in the book, how do we maintain group identity without boundaries and excluding? How do we engage in the practices of embrace and hospitality while maintaining our communal commitment to holiness? Um now that you've kind of had some time to, to chew on that for a while, what would you say? How, how would you answer that question now? How do we, how, how are we, for instance, distinctly Christian and yet embracing of those who are not? Or how are we, how are we distinctly um, uh, living moral lives and maybe embracing those who aren't without, um, while, while still keeping that group identity? Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that is the hardest, not the hardest, but I mean the, the most potent criticism of the book, mm. um, because it kind of lays out this radical inclusion of hospitality. But people eventually, whenever we come back and say, you know, but if you if you just radically welcome in everything, then then the community loses its moral focus and fiber. Um, and um, it, isn't this whole purity psychology at the end of the day trying to prevent, you know, us from incorporating bad things into the body, you know, physical body or the body of the church? I mean, isn't there fundamentally a root, some protective mechanism that needs to be in place? And, and in the book, I, I, I basically say, yes, I recognize that, but, but, but I would argue that, that my, you know, it's not a, I don't have a fully worked out answer to that. So I've been thinking about that since then. And I'm here to tell you that I have a great answer for that. I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> I was bracing myself there to everything. I was, I was, my ears but, were perked up. <laughs> yeah. I am still mulling it over. My current best answer is, is that whole holiness, um, is a, and, I'm, and this is going to actually come out of my blog. Uh, this is very new. Um, I haven't t- posted on this yet, so this is the first time I've kind of articulated this. Um, is that holiness, in my mind, is a, a, so, a sort of prerequisite uh, to being available, radically available to other people. Um, that, that holiness isn't an end in itself. And I think that's a problem with holiness in the Christian community. 
you know, why are we so supposed to be like sexually pure? Why are we supposed to kind of not be addicted to substances? Why are we to, you know, you know why, why are we pursuing all these pietistic things? Usually most of them deal with hedonic excess, you know, pleasures and managing those, being self-controlled. Like, why do we do all of that? And usually the answer is because God wants us to be. And so it's pursued as an end in itself. And I think, I think though, what holiness is supposed to be doing um, is a means to an end. The end goal isn't to be morally pure, mm-hmm. I mean, but it is to be available to others. It is to love. But to love properly and fully, um, I have to work at the same time on holiness. And so, the example that, that uh, of, of, here's one example like uh, sexual purity. I mean, if I'm not, as a man, if I'm not sexually pure, and and I found myself called to be a missional person to sex sex workers in an inner city, you know, let's say I was living in in an urban environment, and those are just the people that I was around a great deal, you know. Um, You know, could you work with them if you weren't sexually together yourself. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, can, can I... I work a lot with female co-workers and female students. You know, can I be available to them if I'm not sexually together, have sexual mm-hmm. integrity? Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the idea here is, is, that, is that holiness is a way to kind of so manage my own self Mm. that I can not use you to gratify my my needs. The mm. example here is sexual, but it but it can it's other kinds of things, right? If I'm if I'm addicted to substances or things like that, the the, the, the problem with that isn't necessarily that, you know, God doesn't like smokers or he doesn't like people who who do drugs or drink alcohol, it's that God's some sort of Puritan up there. You ever hear that quip that a Puritan is somebody who uh what is it what is the joke? A Puritan is uh, somebody who is angry that somewhere is having a good time. You know? <laughs> like God is, is you know, because that's what the vision I always got. Holiness was about this mural, moral puritanism. Mm. But to me, um, if I can't be fundamentally self-controlled, I can't move through the world thinking about you, because I'm always mm. trying to fulfill some sort of my own, my own craving. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I'm hearing you say is that holiness becomes the means to the end of helping people, because if you're if you're somehow not not living in holiness yourself, then instead of you helping that person, you'll end up using that person to gratify something that that you've not worked out in yourself. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Mm. Um, so holiness, in my, my the way I'm viewing it now, is that holiness is something that makes us more hospitable because I become more available to you. Mm, wow. Otherwise, otherwise, if I'm not a holy person, then what I'm going to end up doing is trying to use you to kind of maximize my own pleasures or my own position in the company, or you know, I'm going to treat you in a kind of a Machiavellian kind of way. Mm. Um, uh, and and so. So, that, so that's one of the things about Jesus that's so intriguing, right? I mean, the reason why Jesus can be out there with past collectors and sinners is because of his holiness. You know, he, mm-hmm. he's out there on the edges of society, um, but he he isn't morally compromised by those associations because of his holiness. But because he's holy doesn't mean he's setting himself out and apart in a way. It's his holiness that allows him to be in the darkest places of the world um, and not um, succumb, not not be pulled into all of those uh, kinds of things. Hmm. And and I and again, I don't know if many of us are, many of us are not going to achieve Jesus level levels of holiness, right? And there's certain places where we can think about that, right? There are certain places in this world, certain dark places where I cannot go yeah. because I would be. It would hit me in my weak spots. Yeah. But that's an interesting statement, right? Because you're essentially saying there are certain places I cannot be missional. I can't be sent to those places because I've achieved the requisite holiness yet. Wow. Wow. And so so I think there's a relationship there. But if I had that holiness, 
um, I, I, I could go there and be planted there, you know. Which See, is the, I, that's the exact opposite mentality of what many of us have been steeped in. Right. Yes. The hmm. idea is to pull away from all of that and to stay away rather than be sent into it. Mm. You know, the idea is to be called, you're, you're set apart, not to be set apart, but to be sent, you know, mm. to be sent to be salt and light um, out there. And so, um, and that's kind of what Jesus does in his high, high priestly prayer. He says, you know, sanctify them in the truth. But he, but he says, um, but I, I don't want you to, you to take them out of the world, but he says, I want you to protect them from the evil one. Because I am sending them out into the world. And so my idea here is that holiness is a form of protection. Mm. You know, uh, holiness is what protects you as you are sent out there. Because if you lack the protection, then you become, you know, um, you, you, you falter, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then it, then, then it all becomes about you again, your own, you know, sin or whatever. Um, so... Again, that's that's just a, that is just a a thought balloon at this point. Um, and so the people, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what your, the people at the podcast think about what we just talked about. This idea of holiness as kind of missional protection mm. and the relationship between being holy and being sent. Um, uh, I think you're absolutely onto something there. I definitely yeah, it, think you're onto something. But I'll keep thinking about it. Maybe I'll come up with something else but right now that's my my best idea about I, that I, i'm pretty impressed with that answer <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you uh the the last section in the book that you talk about is mortality which is you know we, we've done three episodes you and i together talking about your slavery of death series which really is a almost an unabridged form of what you did in the mortality section of unclean. But I want to pull out just a few thoughts from that section and encourage our listeners. Um, a lot of people I know have just started listening to the podcast in the last few months. If you have a chance and you haven't listened to the slavery of death series, when you get done with this podcast, it would really be a, I think it'd really be a help to you to go back and listen to those three episodes because they so tie in with this episode so well in uh, unpacking all of the, all of the issues surrounding uh, this, just our, our own mortality and how that so controls us and puts us in fear and keeps us from walking in the love and the hospitality that we're talking about tonight. Um, a few things I just wanted to bring out from the mortality section that I just thought, gosh, this, this really goes with what you're talking about tonight and hospitality and, and love and, and boundary crossing is you, you're talking about that we've got to combat the illusion in the church that that says we need to quarantine ourselves so that we have a willingness to embrace need, decay, and vulnerability. And I, Richard, I think that what you just expounded on with uh, talking about holiness as as moral protection for a missional life, I think that really you said it brilliantly right there. It's this, instead of holiness being something that causes us to quarantine ourselves from the world it, it it's something that actually leads us into an embrace of the world and you played this out so brilliantly i thought in your section about the incarnation i was highlighting like crazy on the <laughs> things that you had to say about the incarnation um and i just want to read a couple of quotes okay. you said in the incarnation god crashes through the quarantine of holiness and purity erected around him often the church is found running the other way and in our effort to sanitize our spiritual lives, we can refuse God full access to the world. So we become too spiritual and deny the truth of the incarnation. And something that you brought up that I just found fascinating um, was a, a piece of art by, I, I, don't, I don't recall the gentleman's first name, but Serrano. Right, um, Serrano's. Huh? Yes, his, his uh, photograph called Piss Christ. Uh -huh. And... The moral outrage, and this is something you talked about earlier in the book, is that moral outrage focuses, or, or it, it actually is a cross-purpose with uh, empathy, that you can't have empathy and moral outrage simultaneously. And you talked about the moral outrage that was uh, especially came out from Christian senators and congressmen and, and just Christians at large around the world because of this piece. Can you tell us about this piece and what the outrage was about and how you see it as maybe 
pointing us to some of the problems that we have actually believing in the incarnation. Yeah, um, uh, one of the, 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 the provocative aspects that I'm trying to deal with there is, is, is how Christians seem to struggle with the fact that Jesus even had a body. Um, and, and by that, I mean, most Christians recognize that he had a body. But we, we, we want to quarantine Jesus from the disgusting aspects of the body. Um, and the disgusting aspects of the body are things like our metabolic functions, you know, urination and defecation. Um, it has to do with our bodily vulnerabilities, uh, decay and illness. Um, it also has to do with sexuality. You know, sex is, gets caught up into these conversations, too. Or, and so... Um, so when I talk about this denial of the incarnation, I'm talking about that, that somehow the Savior um, had to somehow not participate in those things because if he did, um, he would that would be blasphemous somehow. And that, so that's that too spiritual um, move that sometimes we make. We have to somehow kind of quarantine the spiritual from the physical um, because if they connect then the spiritual will be contaminated. And so, and we actually do that in the way we imagine Jesus. And so you see all of this uproar whenever people suggest that Jesus might have had a sexual life or, or been sexually tempted. Um, I got in trouble at ACU uh, once for suggesting in a public forum that Jesus might have suffered from diarrhea. Um, <laughs> you people got caught. in trouble for that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, because Pete, the person said that that was blasphemous <sighs> and that it would have never happened because Jesus would have healed himself. That oh, was the my goodness. And, but, and, and my point there is, 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 okay, think through psychologically how somebody gets to that point. Like, what are they trying to protect themselves from realizing? Wow. And, and what, they're, what they're doing I was argues they're just kind of fleeing the mortal condition. Um, they're fleeing their own bodies. They're fleeing the bodies of other people. Wow. And, and this is where it gets into the slavery of death issue, because cause what I argue in the book is this flight from the body, the, the grime and the grit of the body is really a, a flight from our own mortality. All the signs of our um, disability, the signs of our um, decay, um, the, the symptoms of death in our lives. We want to deny them about ourselves, um, but but that leads us to deny them in other people. And so we hide from public view or our own view the disabled uh, and the broken and the crippled and the handicapped and the mentally demented and, and the, the mentally retarded and the, all of these people that remind us that the body, they know that there are these bodies and they, they ooze and they break and they they age, um, they smell. We want to hide that away because of these anxieties. And we do it for Jesus, too. So coming back to Piss Christ, Serrano was an artist, um, and he, he took a, he, he had this, uh, he, he took a crucifix and he put it in a, uh, a pitcher or something that was filled, I think, with blood and urine. So it had kind of an orange, red look to it. And so he took a picture of the crucifix through the blood and the urine, and he titled it Piss Christ, and he put it on display in an art thing, and all this Christian outrage broke out because he was blaspheming, you know, demeaning the cross. And what I do in the book is kind of pause in front of that artwork and ask a different set of questions, which is... Um, but what is it about the connection between Christ and, you know, our me- me- metabolic functions, piss in this case, urine? What is, it about, what is it about urine that creates blasphemy? You know, what is that? Um, mm. Because uh, when we think about the incarnation, when we think about Jesus being born in a stable and the amniotic fluid and the blood and the you know the baby coming out you know we tend to have a pretty hygienic view of what happened there, mm-hmm. um, but bodily fluids, the messiness of life um, was you know was a part of what it meant to be participate fully in the human condition, and so there have been other Christian responses to Piss Christ suggesting that maybe 
Um, maybe Serrano intended it to be subversive and blasphemous, but perhaps the gospel and the, and the incarnation is even more subversive. Maybe, maybe the gospel, we can subversively read his Christ as a profound mm. meditation on the incarnation, mm. that God descended into literally the piss and the shit of the world mm. and was not contaminated by it, but was embraced by God. Because in many ways, that's kind of what happened, right? You know, yeah. God descended into the very lowest things of the world and was not contaminated by it, but redeemed it. Mm. Um, but, you, you know, you have to... It's an exercise of imagination um, that, that many Christians aren't willing to do because they figure the, con- the contact between Jesus and the worst of the world is unimaginable and um, demeaning to Jesus. So we want a superhuman Jesus. Well, yeah. and, and, and that heresy has been with the Church for a long time, right? That's the Gnostic and Decetic heresy mm-hmm. that Jesus really really can't participate in the physical condition because it's demeaning and evil. Hmm. And what's so ironic about that is here we are 2000 years removed and you have whole letters of the Bible of the new Testament written against that heresy. And it seems to be the characterizing uh, mentality of much of the church today is that we put a quarantine around God, like you say, and are, are so careful to protect his otherness and his transcendence that we completely undercut his love. And you said, you said in this part of the book, which I, I thought, man, what, what a quote love and not transcendence giving and not superiority are the qualities that mark God's divinity. And it seems like in much of the church, um, for instance, you know, I, I, I think about the reformed movement you know, the, the idea of the transcendence of God is the characterizing aspect of what it means to be God. The idea yeah. that, that God is other and that he's transcendent and that he's superior to us. And it seems like the incarnation completely cuts the knees out from under that and says that the very thing that characterizes God, if we believe that Jesus is the supreme revelation of God, then that means that God is best revealed in the in in the amniotic fluid, in the shit, in the piss, in the I mean, even saying those words, people freak out because how can you say oh. God and shit in the same sentence, right? I mean, right, right, um, and, it, and it's it's so gnostic to get upset about that, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's saying you know God cannot participate in mm. in that, and what that means is that there's something in the human condition that God can't redeem, Golly. you know, because that's what happens. Okay, we're not talking about fecal matter, but we're talking about people who think they're pieces of shit. Yeah. You know, that's how I see myself. Like, I work with prisoners, and that's how they see themselves. They see themselves as the refuge of society. Mm. And people come to describe themselves that way. Um, or we describe other people that way, you know, mm. as the refuge of society. And, and if God can't redeem that, right, then there's whole... Then, then, then God hasn't fundamentally become human being, you know, wow. that's what I mean by just denial of the incarnation, it, 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 the, the, the refuge of the refuse of the world, um, God can't redeem, you know, because if wow. it touches him, you know, if it touches him, then he'll be contaminated. But that goes back to the very beginning when we talk about that negativity dominance, mm-hmm. that's, that's the logic at work there, that, that if God touches the refuse, refuse of the world, the refuse of the world is more powerful than God. Mm-hmm. That's what's fundamentally saying. So we got to protect God. Golly, that's you know? say law. <laughs> yeah. That's just, I mean, the implications of that. I, I remember when I was going back through your book the second time and, and you were mentioning all these different things and talking about amniotic fluid and urine and defecation and, and, and you mentioned the fact that of Jesus having an erection. And I remember even kind of getting a willy, you know, on the back of my neck there and going, and I thought to myself, here I am thinking that I have fully embraced the idea of the incarnation and I find myself even kicking against some of the real implications of what that would mean. So I think there's a long way to go for all of us in really uh, embracing that because if we ever get a hold of the incarnation and the radical nature of it, it's not only 
it's not only indicative of who God is, but it implicates us to conform to his image, which means that we have radically different practices, which goes back to the very thing we've been talking about for the last two hours. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Mm. Let, let me ask you, in wrapping up, you, you talk about the Eucharist in the book, and um, you talk about it, how, how it's a regulating metaphor for the church, and how it addresses all of these all uh, the disgust mechanism, the the animal reminders that we have that trigger our mortality uh, fears. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of the Eucharist and how you see that as playing into this whole conversation? Yeah, I um, well, obviously, after you spend a whole book explaining why disgust psychology is so bad, <laughs> we, should not, <laughs> we should not behave that way. You want to end with something positive, okay? You know, okay, Richard. What are we going to do about it? So I try to offer two different thoughts about that. And, and one is a more radical, you know, pretty radical idea. And the radical idea is, um, and I think this is the path that most liberal Christians, progressive Christians would go. And I would, I would say that I strongly resonate with this move, which is to say um, that what Jesus does is folds purity into hospitality, you know, folds sacrifice into mercy um, and says, you know, to be pure and holy is to embrace other people. Um, so, so some people think that's a, that's massive, a too liberal embrace the world thing. And I kind of want to say, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> amen. Um, but but I, I can see some people saying, um, you know, worrying about that. So, so that's one move. So then I say, well, then if, if, if we want to go keep purity, if we don't want to deconstruct purity as mercy, um, then at least we're going to have to live with it in a way that it doesn't spin out of control, as it so often does, as we've discussed, you know, in the ways over the last two hours. So how are you going to live with it without it getting out of control? And so... Um, what I what I say it gets out of control when when, when I when it, it undergoes what I call the purity collapse, and the purity collapse um, occurs when um, we start quarantining other people, uh, when we start um, excessively ruminating about our own moral cleanliness um, at the expense of welcoming other people, and when it starts becoming like we've just talked about here kind of a denial of our bodies, mm. uh, pretending we don't have bodies. So how do, you, how do you kind of keep all that in mind when you think about purity? How do you keep the body in mind? How do you keep hospitality in mind? You know, how do you balance all that out? So I say, well, one way is maybe, maybe a, a balanced uh, uh, use of the Eucharist, because the Eucharist has all of the disgust triggers in play. It's centered around food, which is core psychology we discussed. We talk about core disgust. But it also has a moral, the Eucharist also has kind of the moral cleanliness facets where we think of the death and body of Jesus as a cleansing sacrifice. But we're also sharing a meal with each other. And so Paul talks about in the Corinthian letter that we're to welcome each other as Christ has welcomed us. So... The Eucharist is not just a private celebration of my own purification. I'm also to be looking outward for each to others, welcoming them to table. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking about purity at the same time I'm thinking about hospitality, hopefully achieving a tension there. Mm-hmm. But I'm also at the same time eating blood, eating and drinking blood, the body and blood of Jesus. I'm, I'm you know, offensive gritty reminder of the body, mm. um, which keeps the physicality of the Incarnation, the body of Jesus, and are therefore hopefully our own bodies in mind. And so my idea there is, if the, if the, incarna- if, if the, if the Eucharist is practiced in a way where all of those different metaphors are constantly hit upon and, and, and the tension is capped, then we can kind of talk about purity, but in a way that won't cause us to eclipse hospitality mm. and the recognize, recognition of the Incarnation. 
in our own bodies, won't, will, will prevent the Gnostic flight into a too spiritual spirituality. So, um, obviously, many of us don't practice the Eucharist that way. In my church, it's always been a very private ritual that we meditated on the fact that um, in Jesus, Jesus' blood washed your sins away. You know, that, but that would be celebrating in a way that would create the purity collapse I'm talking about that we right. want to prevent. But I think as churches experiment with other ways of practicing the Eucharist, which can hit upon these other ideas, um, you know, uh, one of the things that my church does um, is, uh, is is we kind of all get up and come down front and take it take it together like in a family kind of meal. Sometimes we pass, we don't have ushers pass the tray, we pass them to each other, we call it family style. And so you have to kind of get up and move around and kind of get the tray to the next person or whatever, but it causes you to kind of look at each other. Um, and the point is I think churches can... Um, Experiment, and, and particularly those that I think practice open communion are probably mm-hmm. better positioned to do this. And that's mm-hmm. a whole other debate that I found that I stepped into um, <laughs> the book. Uh, uh, I was at the, you know, the Mission Gathering Church um, uh, up there on the West Coast. If I got any Mission Gathering people uh, listening in, but they're a wonderful church. I got to spend time with over the, uh, um, um, in the fall. Um, and they have a wonderful practice of open communion, and you know the table's open to all. It's just this wonderful display of hospitality. Um, and another good book that I think has a great theology of this is Sarah Miles' book. Take uh, I think it's called Take and Eat. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you've seen that or seen that book, but it is no, a, no. about her her story of kind of coming to Christ, but also opening up a food pantry at this church. Um, but they have a really robust theology of welcoming people to the table and open communion. Um, and what I guess what I'm saying is if, if, if people can practice the Eucharist in these ways that kind of um, bring out the welcoming and the hospitality aspects, th- there is a way to kind of talk about the purity of the Christian life, but in a way that doesn't collapse into exclusion. Mm-hmm. So it's an encouragement more to experiment, I would say, to experiment mm-hmm. with different practices of Eucharist, to kind of bring out these other themes um, so that uh, purity can be talked about, but in a way that doesn't um, collapse into the very worst practices we've been discussing. I think so many times we've seen the Eucharist, especially in more conservative circles, strictly through the you know the dominant metaphor of penal substitutionary atonement, yeah which has caused us to be exclusionary and also I think I think sometimes introspective to the point where we're not really we can't embrace anyone else because we're so busy navel gazing to make sure our own you know shame and all that stuff is dealt with um that that we can't really be missional with the Eucharist so I think that's just a, a great picture of of what the Eucharist could look like the Lord's table and we look at you know you brought out in the book many times about Jesus's table fellowship and how that was so politically subversive. So it wouldn't, it, isn't it kind of ironic that, that our practice of communion, which is kind of a celebration of the Lord's table fellowship, um, would be so exclusionary and introspective and, um, individualistic. And, you know, it seems like, it seems like we almost went the exact opposite way of what Jesus did in his table fellowship with the Lord's Supper. Yeah, so. I, and I think that's this, that's kind of the point of tension, is is that um, rather than being the solution that I recommend, sometimes the Eucharist has become the problem, yeah. uh, and or, or, or it symbolizes um, the problem. Uh, and so I realize in some church traditions it's going to be hard to see change at that at that location. But I would argue that that might be the very location to begin rethinking our practices, mm. uh, and 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 because it, it reshapes the I mean, as the central liturgy of the church, it, it shapes the imagination, um, and, and you, you kind of want your worship. And if you're worshiping this, in this kind of exclusionary, private way, then that that'll form you. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. but if you, um, but, you know, I've had people push back on me, you know, people from close communion, you know, about, you know, 
people people taking communion not being you know you know worthy or and uh and I said you know I, I think I think I think Jesus his death on the cross um when he looked at the world and said father forgive them for they know not what they do realized mm-hmm. that a good a good chunk of what he did there is going to be wasted upon us but that's mm-hmm. what we call grace you know I mean yeah. He's not going to be stingy. Um, so, I mean, do we really fear that, that the blood and body of Jesus will be wasted? It's already been massively wasted. It's been wasted on me. It's been wasted. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's um, God isn't isn't stingy with it. He's extravagant, and so um, so I always kind of say, "Hey, Jesus kind of beat us to the punch on that one." You know, <laughs> already kind of forgiven everybody. So, um, <laughs> who are we to step in and start? deciding who or who is not worthy yeah, yeah wow but there's a there's a robust conversation there you know so any any anybody on the podcast that comes from a closed communion tradition you know i'd, I'd be excited to hear what they think and yeah I, there are, I think there are interesting arguments on both sides i think i think the, the thing we can agree on is is fine for example i had a conversation with chris haw you know chris haw he's a, i know who you're talking about but I, I'm, yeah. I don't know him personally but i know who you're talking about yeah, when he was at the Theology and Peace Conference earlier this summer, Chris Chris was recently converted to Catholicism, and he um, obviously they practice close communion, and um, so we had a really interesting conversation about close communion. But what what Chris does, he's in a new mass community in Camden, New Jersey, a very violent part of inner city, um, and so yeah, they do practice close communion. But one of the things that they do, like during um, the Lenten season, is they practice the Stations of the Cross by going around the neighborhood and pausing at each location where somebody was murdered in the neighborhood. You know, that wow. becomes the Stations of the Cross. And then it, and during Lent, they also have a, have a mass where anybody that was murdered, people who, family members or whatever, come down, and people who died, they come down and embrace those people. What I find interesting about Chris's story is that, yeah, although they practice closed communion, because, you know, that's their tradition, they do practice these other rituals of embrace. Mm. And, and so that might be a, a, a meeting ground between closed communion people and what I'm talking about is that, okay, so communion might be closed. I understand that. Um, I might disagree, and I do. I, I believe in open communion. But if you're going to practice closed communion, I think Chris's community is a good example of what other rituals of embrace are you bringing to your community? Mm. What are the things you do liturgically to say, you know, we love you. You, you know, you are family. You are welcome. You are, you know, you are beloved by us. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and so I think that's the key, right? Some liturgy that shapes your imagination uh, to become a more hospitable people. I think it should be the Eucharist. I think that's the most logical place, given Jesus' ministry of table fellowship with tax collectors and sinners. But if it's not going to be that, then there needs to be, I think, some other experiments in the church to get at that idea. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Amazing. That's all I can say. (laughs) This has been awesome, Richard. Thank you so much for taking all this time. Folks, the book, you got to pick it up. Uh, The book's called Unclean Meditations on Purity hospitality and mortality. Richard Beck, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast again today. We really, really appreciate it. Oh, it was a pleasure. Always fun talking. I'll holler back at you when uh, Slavery of Death comes out. Wow. Mm, 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 mm. Wow. That was really, really good, was it not? Richard, wow. Thank you so much for taking the time to not only dive into the concepts that are in the book, but to take so much time with us to help us pick them apart and to really consider how we might live more merciful lives. Amazing stuff. Um, We recorded this conversation, I guess it was about two months ago, and Richard laid down a Lent challenge for us, a Lenten challenge for us to to take up and, and to try and do during the season of Lent. And even though we only have a few days when this is airing until Easter, I really hope you'll take this as a year round challenge. Um, this is something that I have taken upon myself in the last couple of months to really try and live into. That is not avoiding people and, and people that you would usually shy away from or avoid when you saw them coming to actually engage them intentionally. 
I've tried to start doing that over the last couple of months, and I'm going to tell you, it is harder than it sounds. Um, I've had several failures along the way where I'll find myself avoiding people and then going, gosh, should not have done that. And yet I've also had several successes where I have intentionally engaged when everything in me was saying to run the other way. And I just think it's such a great idea um, to begin to disciple us in the way of being like Jesus, where we always have an ear for people. We always are with people in the moment, uh, being present. And just the fact that, that we're actually expressing love towards people it just seems like such a simple thing, but boy, it is really profound. And I tell you, there's so much in this book that's profound. Um, I just really highly recommend that you go out and get the book Unclean. I don't think you'll be disappointed. I definitely wasn't. I think it is a tremendous read. And there's so much in there that really helps us re-examine some of the things that we've taken for granted, that we've just assumed the Christian faith is about, and really found out that maybe, just maybe, it's not about things like purity and uh, boundary monitoring and all of these things, but maybe it's about living into the way of Jesus, which is about mercy and compassion and love. And I think Richard's on to something there. So definitely go check out the book. Um, guys, I just really appreciate how you all have uh, jumped onto the Facebook page and onto the podcast website and have really made that a home base for just a lot of the discussions that you're having. I'm just so glad that you feel at home there. This is not about Steve or I. This is about all of us. And I really feel like this is a community. And so um, please avail yourself of that resource to dialogue with others about issues that maybe either you have questions about or something that's on your heart that you want to share. Please feel free to do that. You can join the conversation several different ways. You can go to our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash beyond the box. Um, you can go to uh, our Twitter feed. That's just simply to get updates when we post things either on Facebook or when we post a new episode. That's twitter.com slash BTB podcast. And last but not least is our website, um, beyondtheboxpodcast.com. You can also leave comments there. You can leave ideas submissions as well. Um, Facebook's probably the best place as far as the dialogue going, but I welcome your comments. And I know Steve does too on the website. You can also leave an audio comment for us or an audio idea suggestion. Um, if you just go to our website, you'll see a call me widget on the right hand side of the screen. You can click that and we'll actually have our service call you back or you can call us directly. That number is 626-246-6269 or 626-24-NO-BOX. So give us a call. Give us a shout out. Um, if, while you're on there, if you want to do a podcast introduction for us, we would love that. We love getting different people's voices in on these things. All you have to do is simply when the recording starts, just say, hi, my name is Ray. And you're listening to Beyond the Box. Or you could even say, hi, my name's Ray, and then state where you're from. Of course, you don't want to say you're Ray unless you are Ray, <laughs> but you get my drift. Um, if you want to state your name and where you're from and just say you're listening to Beyond the Box, we would love to put that at the front of our episodes. We love getting you guys involved. This is a community, and I really see it as such. So thank you guys for joining us. Make sure to go pick out the book, pick up the book Unclean. And uh, if you get a chance, go over to experimentaltheology.blogspot.com. That's Richard's website. He has a tremendous blog. It's probably the only blog that I check on a very, very consistent basis. His and Derek Flood's The Rebel God. Um, those are really the only two blogs I read consistently. They're just both tremendous. So definitely go over there and drop Richard a note and just let him know that you listen to him on the podcast and that you appreciate him joining us. Guys, have a great week and we'll talk to you later.